Welcome everyone to this service of morning prayer. I'm so glad you joined us today. Well, if you'd like to follow along and have a book of common prayer, we'll begin this morning on page 76. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. On page 79, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Come, let us adore him. And we'll continue with the Jubilate. It's on page 82 at the bottom of the page. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. 
I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. The the reading of the Lord. The second reading is from Romans chapter four. What are we then, what then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome everybody once again. So glad you joined us here this morning. And we are in uh, week number two of Lent and in week number two of our Lenten sermon series entitled The Meaning of the Cross. And so in our series here in Lent, we're looking at, uh, if you will, various aspects of the cross's beauty. And, um, you know, it would have seemed really odd to people who lived at the time of Christ to say that the cross has beauty or compare it to a, a thing of beauty. Now, why is that? Well, because in Roman times, the cross was the means for execution. But for us, the cross has been transformed into a thing of beauty because of Good Friday. And so this week, we're going to look at the cross and faith. So the the overriding purpose and objective of Lent is to grow in holiness. It's to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Now, we do that in Lent by looking inwardly to examine our own lives, to see if there are any behaviors and attitudes in us that are out of sync with God's plan and purpose for our lives. And so are we believing or thinking in ways that are out of line with the will of God? Are we behaving in ways that are out of line with God's plan and purpose for our lives? Those are the kinds of things that we like to reflect on. And so today in our gospel lesson in John 3, we meet up with this individual named Nicodemus. Now, there's a lot we don't know about Nicodemus. However, there are some things that we do know. We know Nicodemus was like Jesus and Jesus' disciples, a Jew. We know that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And at the time of Jesus, Judaism, understand, wasn't one monolithic group of believers that all believed the same things. No, there were many different sects within Judaism. Now, they had some beliefs in common, but they disagreed in some areas of faith as well. Uh, Pharisees, for instance, believed in things like angels and the existence of the afterlife, a resurrection of all the faithful at the end of time. But the Sadducees didn't believe in any of those things. We also know that Nicodemus was a spiritual leader within this group called the Pharisees. And perhaps, uh, scholars say, Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. We also know that Nicodemus was a teacher, a rabbi. He was someone who would have known the Mosaic law and been able to instruct others. So in other words, Nicodemus was someone who had achieved the very highest standing and had high regard among his peers. Spiritually speaking, you really couldn't reach a higher echelon that what Nicodemus had reached. Now, keep all this in mind because it's going to be important as we go along today. And so it says this esteemed teacher and leader comes to Jesus by night. Now, John, the gospel writer, doesn't tell us why Nicodemus comes at night. Some have speculated that it's because Nicodemus doesn't want other Jews to know that he's visiting with Jesus. This highly controversial figure. 
Some say Nicodemus is a spiritual seeker who, after hearing Jesus' message, has questions. Now, perhaps the words and the actions of Jesus has stirred something up within him, and he's curious. He genuinely wants to know if this radical teaching is something that he should consider for his own life. Now, one commentator I read on this passage has kind of a more nefarious suggestion about why Nicodemus visits with Jesus. He says, Nicodemus is being sent by other Jewish leaders to work out some kind of a deal with Jesus. They have seen the influence that Jesus has had and the power of his preaching and teaching. They've seen his great popularity with the crowds and they want to work out some kind of a, a deal, some kind of a compromise, so they can all get along. Now, I don't necessarily believe this, but that's one person's take on why Nicodemus may be coming to Jesus by night. So, we can speculate, but what we do know is that this Jewish Pharisee approaches Jesus with some words of flattery. Nicodemus says, we know that you are a teacher who's come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And so someone might think, well, that's a pretty nice thing for Nicodemus to say. After all, the Pharisees by and large are saying some pretty critical things about Jesus. So you think Jesus might just respond to Nicodemus by saying, well, Nicodemus, thank you very much for those unexpectedly kind words. No, but that's not what he says. Jesus cuts right through this very polite introduction to the heart of the issue. He says to Nicodemus, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above, or other translations say, without being born again. Now, I think today that that term born again causes people to react in certain ways that are unintended by Jesus and John who wrote this gospel. And I think we need to just put all that contemporary baggage behind us and look at what Jesus really means by using these terms. Now today people will say there are a group of Christians that say that they're born again Christians and people will either want to be identified with this group or not. <laughs> but let's see what kind of thinking that the scripture has in that regard. Really dig in to what Jesus means. Now notice here Jesus is not saying that there's just one group of super spiritual people who are born again or born from above while other believers are not. Jesus is saying, listen, everyone, all people need to be born again or born from above. Without being born again or born from above, Jesus says you're not able to enter the kingdom of God. Because being born again or born from above is the process by which you get in. You know, the other kind of surprising thing I want you to see is this. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, in spite of your status and success, in spite of how other Jews view you in spite of all your good works, in spite of your wise teaching, you've got to go back to the beginning. You've got to start over, if you will. Nicodemus, you've got to be born from above or born again to enter the kingdom of God. Really what Jesus is saying is, Nicodemus, what you've achieved, even though you're this great and influential spiritual leader, will not get you over the goal line, if you will. And the goal line in this instance is what Jesus calls eternal life. And so by this point, I think Jesus has Nicodemus reeling. He says to Jesus, well then, how can anyone be born after he has grown old? He doesn't understand because he's thinking in physical terms, earthly terms. He's thinking about a physical birth process when Jesus is talking about a rebirth, a spiritual rebirth in the heart. 
Jesus says no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Now, chances are water here represents baptism, not uh, Christian baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, because that's not around when Jesus is speaking those words. No. What water likely represents is a baptism of repentance, which is what John's baptism was all about. And so unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he or she cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this is the spiritual birth that Jesus is talking about. And Nicodemus says, well, how can these things be? And Jesus says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're a religious teacher and you don't understand this. So Jesus doesn't leave this a mystery. The answer to the question, how is one born of the Spirit or born again, is clear. If you notice, for the rest of the section, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, and, and Nicodemus apparently only listens. And first, there's this really odd story in the Old Testament in Numbers 21. This is kind of a background for what's being said here in John chapter 3. And in Numbers 21, Moses is leading the people of God in their journey in the wilderness. And the people begin to grumble and complain to Moses, saying, you know, why did you bring us out of Egypt to this place where life is so difficult? And just as Moses is dealing with grumbling people, they start getting bit and killed by snakes. And so this is really odd. God says to Moses, what I want you to do is to make a bronze snake and hoist it up on a pole. And when people are bitten, all they need to do is look up to the bronze snake on the pole and they'll live and they won't die. Again, as I said, there's a really odd story, but that's the story. And so Jesus says to Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the serpent or snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So you see, one of the reasons this really odd story is in the Old Testament is that it prefigures a time when Jesus himself would be lifted up on a cross. And he says those who believe in him and the work that he did on the cross for them will be saved, will have eternal life. And just in case Nicodemus misses the point of all that, Jesus puts it in the clearest terms possible when he says in the very next verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So how are we born from above? We're born again. What's the key to entrance into the kingdom of God? Well, Jesus makes it crystal clear. He says it's by believing in me. It's by placing your whole faith and trust in me. How could it be any clearer? How could it not be clear? Because this is one thing the Lord wants to leave no ambiguity about. So the question is, how does this faith in Jesus tie into the cross? Where do faith and the cross intersect, if you will? John Stott said this. It's really quite profound, I think. He said, before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Now, it's interesting. I think almost every Good Friday and Holy Week, this question rears its ugly head, generally in magazines and news articles, writers and journalists perhaps seeking to stir the pot, ask, who's responsible for the death of Jesus? Is it the Jews who largely rejected him as the promised Messiah? Or the Romans, who were the ones who tried Jesus and crucified him? 
Was it Judas or was it someone else? And the truth is, the Bible says it was us. It was our sin that put Jesus there. In fact, ironically, this reality is nowhere better expressed than in the Old Testament in a passage that speaks about the coming Messiah in Isaiah 53. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like the lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Before we can begin to see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. Isaiah confirms it. It was our sin. It was our iniquity. It was our transgression that put him there. Do you believe that? You need to believe that. Because that's where the cross and our faith intersect. In the Nicene Creed, it says, For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. He was crucified for our sake because there is nothing we can do to save ourselves. What about obedience to the law? What about trying our very best to obey God's commands? You know, the story of the Old Testament is that people tried that. It didn't work. No matter how hard they tried, they violated God's laws and broke his commands time and time and time again. Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We try to hit the mark. We most often have good intentions about obeying the Lord, but we fall short time and time again. The Reverend Dr. Tim Keller uh, makes this observation about this key verse in 1 John that says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Keller says we might think when it comes to our confession and God's forgiveness of our sins, it makes the most sense for John to say God is faithful and merciful. But he says God is faithful and just. God is just because if we confess our sins and he doesn't forgive us, then that would be unjust because that's why Christ came. That's why he died. Again, Jesus was fulfilling God's very purpose for his life when he died on the cross. But there's another aspect of God's justice that we need to acknowledge here. God is a loving God, full of mercy and compassion. And those are qualities and characteristics that people most often emphasize about God, and rightly so but he's also a just God. God is often likened to a judge in the Bible. And what if we encountered a judge in modern life who let everyone off scot-free, who came before him, who'd committed a crime? We'd cry out, that's unjust, and that judge should be disbarred. Now, we wouldn't question the judge's love, mercy, or compassion, we'd question the judge's sense of justice. Because if a crime has been committed, then restitution needs to be made to satisfy the just demands of the law. A story. One day a judge was sitting in court, and it was a normal day until the last defendant appeared. The judge glanced down from his bench and realized that it was his dearest friend from growing up who was before him. 
This friend had taken an unfortunate turn and had violated the law. The evidence was clear, and only one verdict was possible. The judge's friend was guilty. And this broke the judge's heart. The fine was $10,000, or up to six months in jail. The penalty for this infraction had to be paid. If the judge let his friend off scot-free, he would have been disbarred. It would have been the height of injustice. So the judge took off his judicial robes, stepped down from the bench, took out his checkbook, and wrote the court a personal check for $10,000. And he said to his friend, the debt has been paid. You're free to go. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Lord himself took off his heavenly robes, stepped down from his heavenly home, and was nailed to the hard wood of the cross. He lived the life that we should have lived, but couldn't. And he died the death that we should have died, but now we don't have to. Because the Lord himself on the cross satisfied the just demands of the law. Friends, we need to know that no matter how good we think we are, no matter how much we think we love God, no matter how much we try to follow Jesus, we fall short. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. So we are utterly dependent on Jesus to save us. And this is where faith and the cross intersect. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll continue on page 87 with the third song of Isaiah. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open. By day or night, they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your walls salvation and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day, By night you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. And the next, uh, we're going to do Canticle 13, A Song of Praise. It's on page 90 of your prayer book. Glory to you, Lord God of our fathers. You are worthy of praise. Glory to you. Glory to you for the radiance of your holy name. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you in the splendor of your temple. On the throne of your majesty, glory to you. Glory to you, seated between the cherubim. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. Glory to you, beholding the depths. In the high vault of heaven, glory to you. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We will praise you and highly exalt you forever. And then a song to the Lamb, Canticle 18. It's found on page 93. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. 
For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation, a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor forever and forevermore. And then Canticle 21, page 95. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father, all creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the Holy Church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. In the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Suffrages B, on page 98. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. And let us pray. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word, Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Lord God Almighty and Everlasting Father, you brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray for the ministry of Christian formation leaders. We also pray for the Church of the Province of Southeast Asia. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to you all who have died that their deaths may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. And we pray for all those whom we see love but see no longer Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. Amen. From our chapel prayer list, we lift up Retta Miller, Marcine Thompson, Chubby Rice, Sally Wiseman, Nancy Malding, Lindsay Presley, Eve Daniel, Harriet Strait, Marilyn Siragotis, the people of Ukraine, those in Syria and Turkey affected by the recent earthquake. We celebrate the birthdays of Catherine Carter, Sarah Condi, David Ellis, Patricia Malinuk, Lee Mingi, Anne O'Farrell, Richard Sassnet, and Linda Smith. We pray for the safety of our military, remembering especially Brian Dugan, Edward and Katie Cloyd, Alexander, Isaac, Natalie, and Gavin White. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. The General Thanksgiving, page 101. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. And let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.